Thanks, Cameron. I am really, really happy to be here. It was, it was a little tough to make it happen, but I managed to put together a couple of gigs so that I could uh, afford to come, come out here and get the uh, travel taken care of. And, and I'm particularly happy to be here for a very specific reason, which is leaving aside for a moment the specific interest on a number of different levels. This kind of gathering is extremely unusual in today's discursive environment meaning the ways people talk about all the sort of different dimensions of modern society, science, technology, architecture, pop culture, visual imagery, comic books, whatever. You have all of these different realms, and many times they're just kind of going down their own little, their own little corridor. And what do we have here? We have research scientists, we have sociologists, we have visionary artists, we have extreme speculators working on the farthest out fringes of quantum physics, et cetera, et cetera. Historians, uh, people influenced by postmodernism, people absolutely opposed to postmodernism. We have a very, very wide range of voices and perspectives. My favorite thing about drugs as a discourse, not necessarily as a phenomenology, but drugs as a discourse is that they are necessarily and intensely interdisciplinary. They are, there's no way to engage them on a, from a singular kind of perspective. Um, I, you know, I've seen a lot of very interesting and stimulating talks uh, today, but one that really got me, that really impressed me particularly was by uh, Alberto Groisman. I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right, Brazilian. Uh, and he made a point that there's this interesting thing that's happening now. There's a lot of research in ayahuasca. You can do it in Brazil. They're very smart, they have a lot of good schools, there's a lot of stuff that people are doing. And he was saying that, that his, from his perspective it was becoming more and more uh, a, a, a working idea that it's something about the substance itself that causes these changes. So there's something about the chemical. You know, we take the chemical, this is the Western model, we take the, this chemical, it goes into our skulls, it does things inside our skulls that we can measure and sort of and point to. And he was saying, look, there's no way to extricate the effects of this compound from its social situation, from the fact that it's being taken in a ritual, it's being taken in a certain context with certain sets of expectations, i.e. culture. So we cannot pull this scientific object that we can explain that has some kind of pure mechanism outside of the context of this culture. And by culture, he didn't even just mean the people who were taking these things and had their own voices, their own ways of framing the meaning of this chemical. He also meant, and this was the beautiful gesture, the spiritual realities that are, uh, that are produced through these mechanisms. So he, had, he had, had taken film of the ceremony that he was talking about, and it's a particular subset of daimi that incorporates Afro-Caribbean elements, so there are elements of mediumship or spirit, what we call spirit possession, although possession is kind of a bad word, incorporation is a better term, but basically spirits would come into people. And he, took, he filmed this and he asked the, the, the folks he was studying, hey, can I show this film at, the, at this conference? And they're like, yeah, yeah, that's fine. And then he realized that he actually had to ask the, the spirit. And they couldn't get it together. They're like, they, no one, you know, they had a ceremony and she didn't show up. And so he was like, look, I can't show it because I didn't get approval. And that's not because he's a believer. That's because he's respecting the matrix, the multidimensional matrix of elements that are, that surround psychedelic practice and experience. So I was like, you know, it was like, he was saying, look, you need to be pluralistic about your representation of this stuff. Now, this is particularly important now, and conferences like this are particularly important because, at least from my perspective in the United States, but I think it really applies to, to Europe too, is there, there are major shifts going on in the discursive universe around psychedelics. And with the rise of psychedelic science, the mainstream interest in psychedelic science, the breakthroughs in psychedelic science, there's this real sense that now is a wonderful time to see if we can take these compounds out, if we can run them through the mainstream, you know, psych psychology and psych psychiatric and, and uh, pharmaceutical main, uh, mainframes and produce possibilities so that more and more people have access to these substances. But to do that, something has to happen, which is that the underground has to be sliced off and put away. You can't do that. You can't walk forward as the scientists revealing 
the wonderful efficacy of MDMA and have all, right next to you this crazy wild freak who's talking about communing with this, the serpents in the Amazon. That's not going to work. And you can see this, for example, in the structure of MAPS conferences. So MAPS is in a very weird place because they have to take money from people who are in the underground and influenced by the underground. But at the same time, they have to represent what they do as in some sense being you know, pure, good science, good clean science. So I particularly applaud the scientists who have come to this conference because increasingly today, you can go to a psychedelic conference that is largely you know, exclusively scientific or regulatory or kind of a safe, modern way of talking about these things with the, the crazy stuff uh, left to the side. And I, I really think it's important to maintain these spaces that are more open, even if they're kind of crazy, even if they look weird to outsiders. But it's extremely important, not just because it's a cool discursive space, but because the thing itself has to have that dimension. You cannot understand the meaning of psychedelics outside of the context of set and setting. And that means medical set and setting. That means who's the authorities who get to say who gets to take it, in what condition, in what form. It's an appeal, it's something you get you know, from a regulatory agency. All that is going to change the phenomenology of the experience. So we have to remain open in the conversation about the cultural matrix, the history, the, the uh, experiential, ritual, visionary, imaginistic, poetic dimension of these things as we step forward with them as substances. Although I, I'm, I'm actually of two minds about it. Sometimes I ask myself, I go, I love the crazy weird stuff. I love this cr clashing of science and poetry and vision and subculture and I, I think it's wonderful but I ask myself would I sacrifice that or would I sacrifice that in my own discourse my own practice if it enabled these substances to more easily become available to more people because in some sense that's kind of what's happened and it's a very interesting place and it's just something that I think we all get to wrestle with a little bit but how we bring the multiple dimensions of our thoughts and feelings around these compounds into the public presentation of what they mean and what they can do. So that's kind of a, you know, a, a big picture way of saying why I'm particularly happy to be here uh, because it, it's keeping that open-endedness alive and I think you can feel it in the, in the, the conversations and the, 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 the crosstalk between these multiple uh, perspectives. What I'm going to talk about today, and I'm actually just going to lay my cards right on the table and then go and tell you some historical stuff. I am, at the core of my appreciation of psychedelics is death. For me, the most uh, 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 let's see, valuable aspects of psychedelics at the end of the day, on top of all the many ways in which they have inspired me and they've inspired many in, in cultural production is their capacity, at least the part that fascinates me, is their capacity to be uh, uh, phenoptic simulators <laughs> to give you a, a run through of the last ride. Uh, and that aspect of the, the question of the sort of s the, the, the dress rehearsal death and its relationship to psychedelic phenomenology and to how we think about psychedelics uh, is really my core kind of interest and motivating, and, and what's motivating me. And why, one of the reasons that I find that the topic of death extremely important um, is one is something that even this community doesn't quite engage with, with the ferocity and uh, sobriety in some sense that it requires. But more than that is that the relationship of psychedelics to death, to our own dying, to our own fear of dying, to the, the anxiety and fear of others, including people who are, are not interested in these substances per se, that that is a place where the wiggy spiritual side, this subjective, experiential, cosmic, crazy side of psychedelic experience, and the palliative, healing, medically recognized, psychotherapeutic aspects of uh, psychedelics, those potentials that are now increasing and becoming more and more part of the discourse and the institutions that create the context for these drugs, that death is the place where these things come together. So that's one of the reasons I think it's a really important uh, topic. And so what I'm going to talk about today is kind of a history of this idea of the psychedelic bardo. 
uh, and some problems and some uh, really, I think, very interesting uh, dimensions of the issue. So we're going to start with Evan Wentz's Tibetan Book of the Dead, which is a very peculiar book. You know, it's almost certainly the first book of Tibetan uh, Buddhism that any of us in this room ever heard about or thought about, maybe even the first book of Buddhism that we encountered. But it's, it's kind of a strange uh, document um, because it's, uh, Evans Wentz was on the one hand a scholar of sorts, you know, he knew how to do scholarship, but he was also a wacky man, a seeker, a theosophist, someone perfectly willing to add poetics into his accounts. Uh, so his, his translation of the Tibetan Book of the Dead, which is based on an actual cycle of Tibetan uh, texts that date uh, technically from the 14th century, but were actually, uh, in, according to the lore, produced by the great sage Padmasabhava around the 11th century. Uh, but these sort of collection of texts, the Bardo Thodol, what is known, I'm, not, I'm sure I'm not pronouncing it correctly, uh, what is be better translated is, is liberation through hearing in the in-between or in the bardo. And, he's, and he took some of these texts, translated them okay with some fuzzy stuff, redacted them, repackaged them, put all this uh, you know, introductory material that was not particularly accurate, and retitled this thing. The, uh, the, uh, the Egyptian Book of the Dead was really hot at this time. It was just the 1920s. Everyone was crazy for the Egyptian Book of the Dead, so he retitled it the Tibetan Book of the Dead. Uh, and it became a it was a hit, huge hit, even from the get-go. Always in print, you know, thousands of, you know, five different printings of the first edition. Later editions have Carl Jung in it, have Lama Govinda. And it becomes one of those co cornerstone texts of sort of the freak underground, like anyone who's trying to think their way through psychedelics and alternate spirituality. This is a, you know, a major text, a really important text. And so it's taken lots of different forms. There's lot, been lots of translations. People wrestle with the title. Uh, it does very well. Uh, but no doubt, now I'm gonna, here's a little picture of, uh, of Evan Swintz uh, with, the, with the translator who he called a llama, but really wasn't exactly uh, a llama, uh, but the most um, uh, uh, audacious version of the Tibetan Book of the Dead, without question, was this text, uh, Psychedelic Experience, a manual based on the Tibetan Book of the Dead by Leary Metzner, who is here, and uh, Richard Albert. This came out in 1964, which means next year is the 50th anniversary of this very important text. Now, this is a very interesting text within the history of psychedelic literature because it's at once very significant, uh, it was very popular, it ran through multiple runnings, even it's in its hardback edition, widely read, very influential for a short period of time, and is now something of an embarrassment. It's a kooky, goofy, problematic, sometimes enervating text because of the tremendous liber liberties they take, not simply with Evans Wentz's text, but with the ideas of Tibetan Buddhism. So if you have, you know, uh, any familiarity with, you know, Tibetan Buddhism really, at least as, even as just sort of an informed, uh, uh, you know, lay person with some interest in it, you can see the kinds of errors and mistakes uh, within it. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit um, more about those. And, uh, uh, but it really was a very significant text at the time. Why? Because it was the first manual. It was the first guidebook. It wasn't just, here are these things over here. It's like, here's a way to actually organize it. And it was widely used. The striking thing when I was doing this research is if I, if I started to ask older people who were trying psychedelics in the mid-1960s, particularly before they were scheduled, uh, it, it, everybody knew about this book. Many people used it. Many people would read it during their sessions. They would read the poems. They would, they would do the tape, they would tape things and play them during the session. So they would, it was really used as a way to uh, organize this chaos. Because imagine, you know, psychedelics just hit the scene, nobody has any idea, we don't even, we don't, we're not reading esoteric books, we don't know how to organize this stuff, here's this handy guidebook. From within the psychedelic community, this, this leads to like, in a way, the, the, the stinging critique of this book, which is that it's way, way, way too heavy handed. It's way, way, way too insistent about the, stages of psychedelic experience that it outlines, drawing from the Tibetan Book of the Dead, 
and the stages of the, of the bardo, which I'll talk about a little bit more, or a lot more in a, in a bit. Uh, but drawing, you know, mapping uh, the stages of psychedelic experience onto the stages of, 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 the, of the bardo, you know, very heavy hand, it's got this authoritarian kind of Germanic tone. So, you know, it didn't take very long for, for people to go, what? what? Screw this, let's just you know, put on some music and crazy <laughs> lights and what's the problem? I mean, in, within psychedelic history, this, is, this, this uh, conflict between these two different ways of, of imagining psychedelics is, is, is sort of uh, mythologized with, it, with the great passage in Tom Wolfe's Electric Kool-Aid Acid Test where you know, Ken Babs and Ken Kesey and the Merry Pranksters show up at Millbrook. Whether or not Leary was actually there, so there's some questions about the account, blah, blah, blah. But basically, they didn't really get along very well. Because at Millbrook, you had Leary and, and Alpert, and they were doing, they were kind of more like elite style. They were Harvard people. They were intellectuals. They had lots of books. And yeah, they were doing tons of experimentation. But it had this certain kind of organization to it. They were you know, taking notes. They were, they were coming up with protocols. And on the other side, you have this wild, anarchic search for the now. Where, where the whole point is to jettison frameworks, structures, foundations, and this kind of clash, you know, in a, in a way is, is narrated when they come to, uh, to Millbrook. And Ken Babs refers to this whole thing as the crypt trick. And he's like, you know, what's the point? What, why would you do that? And in a lot of ways, the pranksters won. Uh, at the same time, this book is really significant because it really does introduce the notion of the guide the notion that there is some kind of structure that can organize a trip, that can, that can pr help set in motion certain effects. And so it does end up being an important text for those people who continue to practice uh, psychedelic therapy and who are interested in developing the model of the guide, although most people, uh, uh, you know, they again reject the degree of over, of heavy handed, excessive, in your face style that this book, that this book has for a much a more minimalist idea of the guide. So that's an interesting bit, but what I really want to focus on is are some of the um, critiques that people, that one would make of this text uh, in light of Buddhism, in light of the respect for other traditions, in light for the com of the complexities of mysticism, and then I will nonetheless defend the text. So the uh, uh, critiques are wonderfully summed up by a, a particular scholar of Buddhism named Donald Lopez. And if any of you are familiar with Lopez's work, he has a very sour view of the Western engagement with Tibetan Buddhism. He basically thinks it's kind of a disaster and not really a conversation at all and something that has very problematic political aspects. He has some very, very good points, very good arguments about what happens when the West appropriates uh, non-Western sources and the, the kinds of violence, discursive and otherwise, that go along with that kinds of activity, something that he sees very much involved with this particular text. He makes the point that even the Tibetan Book of the Dead is, a, in a way, is already almost a Western book because Evans Wentz himself was a theosophist. He read the Bardo literature through a particular kind of uh, ideology. Uh, he, he, he saw evolution in certain terms that made him sort of distort some of the, the elements of the Buddhist text, but it's really with this text that Lopez really goes off about how insane and un d disrespectful and, and really almost kind of violent it is to wrench uh, these texts out of their original context, which are funerary texts for actual dying people in Tibet, and take these things and turn them into what, it, what you know, a manual for an acid trip, is what he talks about it. And in some ways, you can really appreciate that. There's, a, there's an arrogance to this text. It can be very funny, and it's kind of brazen in its remix. I mean, in some ways, it's a very postmodern thing, because the, what they'll do is they'll like take whole, ch whole chunks from the Evans Wentz text and then add a few little psychedelic terms in there. So, there, so instead of like uh, you know, a week, they'll put in like eight hours, or they'll put in like you know, the retinal light show uh, in the midst of the uh, otherwise sort of ponderous uh, text that Evans Wentz had had uh, translated. So there's this kind of humor about it in a way, but it's also a, just a marvelous example of sort of ignorant, arrogant Western appropriation of other people's material that rips them out of the, the original context. It's a good point. But what I want to do is kind of play with it in a different way. Uh, 
So that's a kind of dark view of what happens when religions or different thought systems encounter one, one another. There's a different way of looking at that, a more productive and I think creative, and certainly poetic way, which is what, you ha what happens when different traditions encounter one another is a creative misunderstanding, is a poetic appropriation, is a, a clash that produces something new, something different. And I think that this text is actually very wise and for all its silliness, because it's quite silly, uh, very prescient in recognizing that in some sense the bardo, the notion of the bardo, the particular Tibetan Buddhist expression of death and the afterworld is remarkably appropriate model to understand psychedelic experience and particularly uh, deep psychedelic experience. Uh, so what I want to do now is talk a little bit about the bardo concept, a little bit about uh, the Tibetan model. And what I, I like to do when I'm thinking about religion, when I'm thinking about mysticism, when I'm thinking about mythology and the sort of uh, dreams and ideas and gods that drive people, is to, is to think historically. And it's not to just, you know, escape the truth claims. It's to see that religion, even the, the juiciest life of religion and spirituality, is expressed historically. That it, come, that it grows, it changes, it, it moves in different directions depending on different uh, circumstances. And it doesn't mean it's just a story, just something that's created. But it, I think, can help understand the dynamics that are working in these things. So, the Bardo concept. Uh, just to give like a very brief outline of the Tibetan model, and there are different versions of it, no surprise. Uh, there are different ways of organizing the stages and naming the stages, but basically what happens is when you're dying, the elements, almost like alchemical elements, um, in your body collapse. And when they finally, the earth element is the last to go, and when it goes, you get a flash. This is a flash of the clear light of the all, uh, the absolute, which almost certainly all of us are gonna shrink away from in terror, as if we were screaming at the peak of a 5-MEO hit going, no, please, back to the place with my girlfriend and teddy bears and hot chocolate. Uh, so you have this flash, you know, you have this flash, and then a little bit happens, you get another flash, there's two flashes, there's two shots, and then, having failed to uh, release, one encounters the, the bardo of reality, and the bardo of reality is where the uh, hundred wrathful and peaceful deities emerge in what, a variety of different forms, partly depending on your own uh, state of mind. You're terrified, you're excited, you're pulled in multiple directions. At every, op every part of the stage, there's still the opportunity to see through it and to, in, sense, in a sense, transcend this whole uh, phantasmagoria. But again, most of us have trouble with that because it's really hard to deal with this, you know, kind of screaming. Uh, let's see, I think I have one of these. So here's the, uh, the hundred uh, peaceful and wrathful deities, but this gives you a little bit more sense of, you know, the kind of uh, encounter they're talking about. Hard to go, yes, this is just a projection of my own mind. It's, it's a, a face of emptiness. It has no claim. So it's tough to do. So anyway, we stumble through the bardo of reality, and then we stumble through the bar bardo of becoming, which is where uh, our sort of uh, it, it ultimately our kind of neuroses draw us back into, uh, you know, human life or perhaps another kind of life. Uh, where we're sort of wandering, where uh, we witness a kind of shamanic dismemberment of our own bodies and a reconstruction where uh, ultimately we see a couple making love and in a peculiar anticipation of Freud, that is really quite remarkable, the text says it, we're, you know, attracted to the mother, and it's written from a male point of view, attracted to, to the mother and, wanted, and are angry and, and wrathful towards the father. And this excitement sucks us back in, and so there we are, uh, born again. Whee! You know, uh, so takes your ticket, enjoys your ride. So this basic idea of the bardo go, it exists before uh, Tibet goes Buddhist in the uh, you know, first few centuries of the common era. There are, there's this description, which I'll, I'll read you. Um, of an, a, an early text that gives you an idea of the kind of um, 
And, it, and what, what this really is, is kind of the, some of the first language that we have about uh, the Bardo experience. So let me just find it here. Takes a second. Da, da, da. Oh, come on, where did, I, where did I go? Ah, that's what you get for not using paper. Uh, da, 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 da. Oh, wait, I don't think I have, okay, I'm not gonna, I'm not, gonna, okay, here we go. Uh, when the time of his death is approaching, he sees these signs. He sees a great rocky mountain lowering above him like a shadow. He thinks to himself, the mountain might fall down on top of me, and he makes a gesture with his hand as though to ward off the mountain. Presently, the mountain seems to be made of white cloth, and he clambers up this cloth. Then it seems to be made of red cloth. Finally, as the time of his death approaches, he sees a bright light, and being unaccustomed to it at the time of his death, he is perplexed and confused. He sees all sorts of things, such, are, such as seen in dreams, because his mind is confused. So this is well before the elaboration of this concept into the Bardo thing. But he already has elements, the weight of the mountain, the red and white drops, the, uh, the analogy of dream. And this material then gets taken up in Tibet in a very different kind of context, in a very, uh, uh, in a situation where there's strong shamanistic um, elements. And what's interesting is the more I looked at the, the history of the Bardo concept, it's clear that the, to the degree to which Tibetan Buddhism could be seen as a slice of Buddhism coming from India, even Tantric Buddhism coming from India, and, sh and shamanism, that the, this material that's associated with the Book of the Dead is uh, particularly uh, uh, shamanistic. But let, let's think a little bit more about this category of the bardo, of the in-between, the in-between state. So initially, the in-between state just refers to this period of time between death and life, between the moment of death and, and rebirth. But this idea of the bardo is a very slippery thing because it kind of can apply to lots of things, lots of liminal things. And what you see historically is the development in the 11th century, the 12th century, the 13th century, the, the bardo concept begins to apply to more and more aspects of human life. So even though it initially just re refers to this period between de death and rebirth, suddenly there's a concept where actually Dream is a bardo, and meditation is a bardo, and the life between birth and death is a bardo. So you get this concept of the in-between, the zone of phantasmagoria where you have the possibility of transcendence, but at the same time you're pushed and pulled by your fears and neuroses and anxieties, that that model becomes applicable to all of these different dimensions of experience. The concept multiplies because it's a marvelous metaphor for the in-between, for the basic liminality of our experience, the way in which we are always pushed and pulled between different uh, resolutions that of course never entirely resolve once they arrive. We're always in this kind of flux and flow. So it's a very canny way of saying this sort of, you know, for us, unusual idea of this amazing phantasmagoria in the afterlife becomes a model already within the Tibetan materials for uh, thinking about life itself and experiences within life, like dream, like meditation, as being themselves kind of uh, bardo uh, experiences. So you have this kind of pliable context. Now, turning to the psychedelic experience, uh, it's, it's really, I think, incredibly important to recognize that from the get-go, a fundamental aspect of psychedelic experience in the modern world, in the modern West, is uh, some kind of death rehearsal rag, some kind of uh, uh, death experience. And I'm just going to read uh, a little bit from uh, Albert Hoffman's uh, famous Bicycle Day Fun. Um, and to illustrate it, this is a, a piece by my friend Patrick Turk. And this is actually based on uh, Hoffman's account um, of his own experiences. Uh, and yeah, so here he goes in uh, 1943. He's back home to so the bikes. This is post-bicycle. Dizziness, visual distortions. The faces of those present appeared like grotesque colored masks. Strong agitation alternating with paresis. The head, body, and extremities sometimes cold and numb. Throat dry and shriveled. A feeling of suffocation. 
Occasionally I felt as being outside my body. I thought I had died. My ego was suspended somewhere in space, and I saw my body lying dead on the sofa. So not only is this kind of an interesting you know, death, uh, re death rehearsal rag, uh, but it also has a lot of elements in it that are very similar to the way that Tibetans describe the experience of the collapse of the elements. The sense of heaviness and, and oppression. Uh, he describes uh, sounds at certain points that are very like some of the sounds that are described in the text. So it's a very interesting sense of this kind of fundamental uh, dimension of psychedelic experience being this kind of death um, run through. Leary himself uh, uh, had a very intense trip. His first LSD trip is in many ways, I think, that one of the most important ones in his life. He had already experienced uh, lots of trips with psilocybin. He loved them. He thought it was great. And I don't, from the biography, I don't get the this, this sense that he had anything really super heavy happen. But the first time he took LSD out of, out of Michael Hollingshead mayonnaise jar, uh, he's home in Cambridge, and it gets pretty heavy. He, he turns on the TV, and they're just saying, death, death, death. He looks at a book, and all the words sort of revert. They go back in time to their origins, and they all start saying death, death. And he's like, he realizes that he's a complete construct, and he's totally hollow, that there's, no, there's nothing there, and it's, a, it's freaky. I mean, it's, a, it's a clearly a you know, bad trip. I mean, I don't know what to call that. I mean, it's certainly insightful. I don't know what to... You know, it seems, and, and it ended up growing to something more, it had profound elements as well. He goes outside, he sees the snow. I mean, it's a, it's a full experience. Uh, but this fundamental sense of the hollowness and emptiness of the conventional ego, this idea of ego death, was uh, promulgated by Leary so intensively, partly because that was one of his core experiences. One of his core experiences was a death rehearsal rag out of which comes the idea that, that one of the fundamental gifts of psychedelics is this idea of ego death. And that's one of the concepts that came out of the, uh, out of the psychedelic experience book that went into the po popular culture and uh, really laid down a whole set of expectations about what was supposed to happen. What was supposed to happen is that you have ego death and you experience this kind of transcendence. Well, you can see why this would become a kind of problematic idea uh, down the road, and yet it's something that we still wrestle with. If you listen to people make accounts of why psychedelics are important, uh, what they do psychologically, there's a lot of dimensions of it, but it's clear that one of the core gifts that it, see, that, that it, that, that it provides for so many people is the sense of the artificial uh, or, or dead kind of nature of, uh, uh, of the ego. Now, I think it's interesting, particularly, uh, well, for, for a couple reasons I'll mention, but it's, it's interesting to look at why did Leary choose the Tibetan Book of the Dead? Why did he issue a, uh, a, a manual based on this esoteric text in 1964 when he still had his job at Harvard? What was actually going on there? And it's an important question to ask because I think it, it reveals some of the fundamental dimensions uh, or assumptions, even the axioms that we run on in psychedelic culture, thinking about the relationship between these compounds and religion and death and spiritual transcendence. So Leary, at this point, is a hardcore materialist. He is not interested in religion at all. He's already this you know, very successful professional psychologist. He's very interested in stepping beyond the behaviorist models of the day and emphasizing the social interactions and the games that people play, that, that the world consists, or the social world consists, of a wide variety of games in which we put on different masks, we know the scripts, and we interact in these different ways. And he was interested in uh, challenging this. So what he saw psychedelics doing is as destroying the claims of these games, revealing them as games. So there's this wonderful uh, talk he gives at a psychological organization in 1963, so just before he starts doing his text. Again, he's got his job, but you can see that he's starting to unravel. Uh, and, uh, you know, he talks about this, that the, 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 you know, the big games aren't even just social games. They're like the subject-object game. Well, that's an interesting game. And, of course, ultimately, the ego game. So for him, he was interested in mysticism because it seemed to uh, create a, a framework 
for also undermining or explaining the undermining of uh, the ego in these kinds of uh, transpersonal states. But there's other things going on at the same time. He's good friends with, uh, with uh, Houston Smith. Houston Smith is a very important uh, thinker who really establishes, I think, an idea that many of you probably share. Uh, I'd be actually interested to know this, but it's, it's a really uh, per, uh, strong idea within alternative spirituality, which is the, what we call perennialism. The idea of perennialism is that if you boil it down behind all of these different religious traditions and different practices and different disciplines, it all boils down to the same thing. That at its core, mystical experience is the same for people doing different kinds of practices across the world and across time. This is a, was a very strong idea in the, in the 20th century. Houston Smith was very much a proponent of it. Aldous Huxley contributed to this idea with the perennial philosophy. Leary is kind of coming from this idea because it makes sense psychologically. As a materialist psycho psychologist, you can say, great, there's all these weird religions. They have all these different ways of, of you know, altering consciousness. But if you boil it all down, it's something that we can access psychologically, that we can understand as being a kind of human universal. So this idea of perennialism, that there's something similar between different kinds of states, uh, and, that's, and then that it rides on this fundamental oneness uh, that exists beneath all the different shapes and masks of different kinds of religious experiences, was one of the drivers as well. So he draws from this idea that you can compare Tibetan mysticism, the other side of the planet, in a essentially pre-modern culture, and you can compare that model to a contemporary psychological uh, account of you know, human sociological model. So it's a very weird way of bringing this in because he wanted to break it open. One other element of it that's worth talking about is that in, I think really the origins of the psychedelic experience lie with Huxley's first mescaline trip. When Huxley, at the beginning of the trip that he describes in, in Doors of Perception, he's looking at a chair and he, and he says like the, the chair became like the last judgment. And it, like, it was unclear whether it was the last judgment or the chair. So he's having this apocalyptic uh, vision of furniture in his, in his living room. And he realizes in, in the trip that it's like the, the, the basic question of the bardo, of his, it's his very fears uh, that keep him from recognizing the absolute. So the, the demonic or apocalyptic dimension of his experience was precisely because he was resisting the absolute, resisting the totality, the oneness, because of his fears. And he later talked about, he, talk, he was talking with his wife Maria, and she was like, well, why couldn't, can you, can you go for the clear light? And he was like, no, I, I couldn't do it. Someone would need to remind me. Someone would need to remind me, i.e., some other voice, some guy, would have been very helpful at that point. So later, a few years later, he's talking to Leary. He says, Leary, look, man, we, should, we, we need a guide. We need a guidebook for psychedelic experience. And of course, we all know the, the end of, of Huxley's life that he, you know, uh, uh, he's you know, injected with LSD and he, he goes out on acid, but he also uh, asked Leary within the last month before he died when the manuscript of this text was, was floating around, he asked Leary to read it to him. And Leary was like, no, no, I, I, don't, I don't think you should do that. Uh, I, I should do that. So uh, that, that part didn't happen, but there's a really tight connection with Huxley's own perennialist interests, his own interest in, in mysticism as a way to navigate uh, the phenomenology of psychedelics, and in particular, in light of their relationship, their sort of resonance with the death experience, as if they're kind of uh, it's not just that they simulate, but they actually kind of resonate with that model and so that tricks and techniques that are appropriate for the dead uh, are also appropriate for people going through the, the trip experience. You have all these interesting threads uh, that are combining, um, uh, uh, that are, that are combining in, into this text. So, let's see, which way am I going to go on this one? The, um, uh, So, one of the things that, that Donald Lopez says about the, his, his crit criticism of the psychedelic experience is that they're decontextualizing this text, ripping it out of its original context and doing whatever they want to, this active sort of colonialist appropriation. And he says, 
it's absurd because these texts were funerary documents and they're reading them as kind of esoteric guidebooks for psychological experience. There's something interesting, very interesting, about the Tibetan books themselves and about Tibetan practice. So on the surface, it looks like all these texts are for an actual dying and dead person. They're dying, you're reading it to them, you want that voice reminding you where to go, then you're dead, but you're, you're still able to hear to some degree, and so you're still getting the voice, you're still hearing these things, great, that's fine. But if you look really closely, it's clear that some of these texts aren't actually for that purpose. What the texts are, are basically models for sadhanas, i.e. models for tantric meditation practice. So an, an extremely important part of tantric meditation practice, generalizing widely across different traditions, is essentially running through a death experience. You sit there and meditate, you let the elements go, you sort of develop in a way that's partly created and partly happens through the phenomenology of the process uh, and you kind of go through the clear light you go through these bardos as best you can to try to get used to the experience so you don't freak out I mean there's a there's an interview with the Dalai Lama that's like what is your practice Dalai Lama because basically I just sit there and I try to go through the death state so that I don't freak out when I die so embedded within these apparent funerary documents these sort of rituals for some alien culture that they do with their dead, rituals which, by the way, have much more to do with the indigenous Tibetan relationship with death and dying than they do with Buddhism. That's a whole other dimension to it. It's actually in the part of it, part of the, the, the shamanic elements of Tibetan Buddhism are going to be found around the ferocious uh, uh, nature or models of, of what happens in the, in the, in the afterworld. But embedded within these funerary texts are actually guidebooks for simulated death experience. So that's where you start to go, oh, well, so what exactly is happening here? You have a tradition of the bardo, where the bardo doesn't just apply to death, be between death and rebirth, that the bardo actually applies to all these liminal experiences that we go through. And then you have an uh, incredibly visionary meditative tradition that, that with, has within it this essential kind of practice of going through simulating death processes. And then you have this weird kind of mapping of this whole process onto the psychedelic experience. And so basically what I'm saying is that uh, uh, even though this is a kind of offensive text in some ways, and even I'm not a particularly PC guy, but it's it's pretty offensive in some ways that you could you would do this. And yet there was a, a canny brilliance to it. There was a genius in recognizing that the Bardo concept itself is elastic. It moves forward. It takes new forms in new situations. And that just as the Tibetans recognized that you could take the Bardo concept and apply it to dream and apply it to meditation, some people even apply it to sneezing as a sort of a seizure is really a, a bit of a bardo. You know, deja vu is a, is a little mini bardo you get to go through. That even with that concept, that actually bringing it into psychedelic experience, uh, and particularly its capacity to do a death rehearsal rag, is actually kind of, uh, kind of brilliant and interesting. Um, one more kind of uh, uh, shamanistic element of the thing that I think is, is quite interesting is that compared to other funerary texts and other death-related sadhanas in Buddhist tradition, that the thing that stands out in the Tibetan documents is the voice. If you read the text, it says, you know, you are now seeing this. You are, you know, about to, you're, you're facing a fierce baddie. You must avoid the smoky lights. It's in second person. And so part of the power of the text, of people encountering it, is that it's written to you. So you're like kind of going through it as you, as you do it. It's addressing you as a reader directly. This voice, the voice of the you, the voice of the God, is very specifically linked to deep traditions within Tibet that, 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 that existed long before Buddhism came in. It's the shamanic trace. It's the shamanic trace. And so in some ways, recognizing the, the Buddhist, this, taking in this Buddhist text, into early 
the early attempt to map culturally psychedelic experience and to, and to create a guidebook, a context for people who didn't have any context, who wanted some context, uh, was in some way stumbling onto this shamanic uh, element that is so much more important now because we don't really talk, and we talk about meditation now, but compared to the 60s, 60s it was all about Buddhism and Hinduism. You know, the, the, sh the sh shamanic element comes in a little bit of Castaneda in the 70s, but it's really a remarkable shift in the sort of religious models of psychedelics that we experience now compared to the 60s and 70s. But even within this ostensibly Buddhist appropriation, there really is this primary kind of shamanic trace, this, this, this uh, echo that we hear of uh, practices around energy, practices around immediacy, what you are hearing now, what you are experiencing now. And it's written into this voice of the God, written into the voice of the God. The whole guy has that kind of uh, 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 trace uh, within it. So why is this interesting? Why is this important? I'm just going to kind of re-say uh, what, what I mentioned at the, at the beginning um, and hopefully uh, stimulate questions. We have a nice amount of time here. I think this is a really wonderful topic and I've really enjoyed the uh, question and answer uh, elements of some of the talks, um, you know, sometimes more than the talks themselves. And, and not in a bad way, I just mean that part of the point of the talk is to, is to inspire conversation. Uh, so I would really like to do some back and forth. <laughs> Um, is to say again about you know, why is this important, why is this significant. One of the problems with the religious and spiritual uh, exploration of psychedelics is that for a variety of reasons it leads to all sorts of goofiness, all sorts of fuzzy thinking, crazy new age stuff, this and that, da, da, da. some of it's beautiful and wonderful I love, some of it's hokey and corny, some of it's dangerous, some of it's stupid. And it's, it's part of the scene, it's there historically, it, it, and one of the problems with mainstreaming psychedelics is what you do with this kind of crazy fringe. And I, and I want to insist that I have, I, I have drunk deeply from the wells of the crazy fringe. I, I, I want to really not try to divide myself from some, some you know, wacky excess. I am the wacky excess. But, uh, it, so it's a difficult problem, and for me, when, again, when it comes down to the wire, if someone's like, okay, man, come on, really? Really, how have these things changed? Oh, I've gotten more in touch with nature. Okay, great. Well, come on, really? Really? If I, if I do that to myself, I tear away the romanticism, the exoticism, the desire for escape, the desire for inflation, the desire for, you know, whatever. Like, if I really go down to what is it, what does it really do is that I am strongly convinced that this is the best thing you can do in our world to prepare for death. Meditation too, and, I, and I'm also meditating. And there's something about the clarity of that, it cuts through, and it's interesting because it's at once religious and not religious. Uh, a very pro profound uh, moment in my life was when I went, wait a second, there's all these different religions and they all have different models, like and basically what's the question? Like what the heck happens when you die? That's the question, right? What happens when you die? You're scared, what happens when you die? What, does something happen? Can I prepare for it? Is there something I can do? You know, something bad gonna happen because I'm not doing something? Is it, am I just gonna snuff out? This is one of the main motivators that drives individuals into religion and into, into seeking. I mean, there's a lot of other dimensions of religion, obviously, but that's a, an important one. And then I was like, yeah, these religions, they got different things to say this, and Buddhists say you reincarnate this, and I went, Wait a second, you know, these people die. They don't know. How, how would they know? Well, I, I, I got read it in a book. Well, who wrote the book? Someone who hasn't died. Oh, no, no. Uh, our tradition, you know, we, we're, the masters are communicating with their, their past lives, they're remembering past lives. I'm like, okay. I have, I, you know, personally, I have a tough time with those kinds of claims. Not that I don't believe that it could exist, I just know that I can't. I can't you know, make, know that it exists. So in a way, it's just another story. Somebody else saying, oh yeah, I remember my past life and this is what happened. And, I'm like, and maybe that is what happened, but that's not necessarily going to happen to me. Why is it going to be the same? So nobody knows. It's incredibly liberating and, and terrifying. You know, like, uh, nobody knows. So go at it, kids. And, you know, in that kind of framework, practicing with death, practicing with the simulacrum of death, recognizing as the bardo resonates through your life, that death resonates through your life all the time, 
that that is a, is a very clarifying spiritual practice that has at its core something that is utterly not bullshit. Because we're all going to die. We're all going to be there going, oh, wait, what, 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 no. And it's this mind, your mind now, that dies. It's not like, oh, yeah, I'm going to be like different then, so I can be, deal with it different then. So it's like, I, you know, I'll be different. No, no. It's you now going, oh, it's just, wow. <laughs> you know? So these things are marvelous tools, let alone all of the studies that we're starting to see. So that's where, so my point being, that it clarifies the spiritual dimension of psychedelics very well. It's a very good thing to take on board, and it's partly because it sort of undermines, in my experience and in my mind, some of the tendency towards new age goofiness, towards sort of fuzzy thinking, and just sort of da 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 da, that, that there, there's a, 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 a richness about it as a spiritual practice, and at the same time, it's something that is clearly going to be part, and already is part, of the official psychological, you know, stamp with approval set of claims that we can make about psychedelics, that they help people who are terrified that they're gonna, because they're gonna die soon, like in a month or three months. We know that this can help people deal with this. You know, and it's a funny thing. It was, we were talking to Catherine about this, which is like, okay, so it's good for terminal patients, you know. So let's let's say we can get that regulatory thing. Like you're in a terminal situation, you can take psychedelics because you're freaking out, and it helps. It clearly helps. You look at your ear, look look at all our pile of papers. But we're all gonna die. Can I do that now? I want to do that now because I, if I'm by then I might be too sick. I might be out of it. And the Buddhists are really clear about that. They're like, hey man, you still got about. You should be practicing now because you're when you're gonna die soon, and it's gonna be a it might suck well before you die, and you have energy and you have mind now, so let's get going, you know? And, and in a way, that's kind of the secret, you know, the thing about Buddhism is like, it's not that great, you know, it's not that great for like the celebration of life. I mean, I'd rather hang out with shamans and, you know, whatever, you know, partiers of Dionysians, that's, you know, that's where you go. But at the end of the line, you know, that's really where the Dharma is going to, going to, you know, that's where the metal, you know, the rubber hits the road uh, as far as the Dharma goes. And so, in a way, what, why I'm kind of interested in, in archiving this kind of story and showing that the Bardo concept was a, a, a significant framework for understanding the psychedelic experience from the get-go, and that for all the problematic elements of that, there was something really brilliant about it, and something that's carried through psychedelic culture, and that is manifesting in different ways now, both in terms of you know, official studies and in terms of people's own experiences, and own kind of uh, uh, ways of thinking about it. There's been a lot of talks here that have brought up uh, the simulacrum of death was one phrase that came from, from a talk. I'm like, oh yeah, there we go. Uh, that this stuff, it, it's, a, it's a really uh, important dimension of this discourse.